and in January, I gave a talk on my IoT gadget, right? And, um, and also in Force Asia. So I was trying to say that um, our IoT gadgets rely on battery power and we need to consume as little as possible to extend the lifespan of a battery whilst in this in deployment. Huh? So we don't want the um, gadget to last uh, a short time on the outside. Not, we have to do a truck roll to get the battery replaced. So we need to find means to extend our battery life with um, low power electronics as well as today we discover that our firmware programming styles can affect our um, power consumption. So um, whilst I'm on a project in SP, I'm also building yet another battery powered sensor. Yeah, so um, a vendor comes up to me because um, I, I recounted to him how I did my power readings in the past. I relied on the old digital multimeter, um, which I brought here, but I haven't wired it up to show you guys. So this is my seven and a half digit multimeter. It can do down to nano amperes of current reading. However, all that reading was on static power consumption only. I can only read static currents. And then uh, with an IoT gadget going into active mode, transmitting mode, going back to sleep mode, I cannot see when and how the power is consumed on an average, right? I can only see in short bursts. So if you recall my talks last time, I was, um, my gadget was based on the ESP32. The power consumption was quite low. Um, maybe it's about, uh, maybe less than 10 micro amperes. But for that project, I was very happy that the power regulator used in it was a switching regulator, a step down switching regulator that consumed less than 40 micro amperes. So in sleep mode, that gadget consumed about 50 micro amperes in total. Yeah. I faced some difficulties with that project because when ESP32 wakes up, it draws a huge inrush of current, I think in excess of 150 milliamps. And um, for that project, I actually had two regulators designed in. Um, one of them failed because it cannot support the inrush of current in excess of 150 milliamps. And um, the, the other one, which was based on an LDO, survived and continued powering the ESP32. So from then, I gained some experience that not all regulators are suitable for use in a uh, project which has sleep modes and active modes. Okay, so later again, I found out and I also recounted to the audience that ESP32, when it goes into sleep mode, it <coughs> destroys all its information in memory. And on waking up from boot mode, um, from sleep mode, what it does is that it reloads its entire application program from the flash into the ESP32 RAM to continue operations. Now, ESP32 by itself it does not consume a lot of current during that boot up phase. It is the flash memory. So this is a recognized um, challenge for those people using ESP32 using the deep sleep mode. Yeah. All the memory is lost on boot up, uh, on waking up again. The flash suffers a lot of um, power consumption. So, um, with this in mind, when I'm doing my new project here in SP, right? I, I told a supplier of instruments. This guy is from Techmark. He represents Keysight Instruments. So I, I told him I wanted a data logger with high enough a resolution to read in currents on a dynamic basis. So that way I can see what currents are used in sleep mode, when and where the high current peaks come in. Yeah, so with that, he came back to us and said, hey, there are other better instruments for this, more specific for this kind of development. So one of them was this gadget in front of me. It's a DC power analyzer with a um, RF shield box. I nearly said waffle toaster. <laughs> All right. Another, so this one is a mainframe. It has four slots, two of which is currently filled. In slot one is filled with a DC power supply plus its measurement circuitries. 
in slot two is an RF detent, uh, RF event analyzer or detector. Yeah. Two more additional slots can be filled up with another, um, with uh, other varieties of um, modules. Right. They have thirty three modules in their catalog. Now, so all this was loaned to us last Wednesday. I haven't had a chance to fully practice with it, so I'm not very familiar. So while I'm giving the demonstration, uh, I might receive some hints from my colleague here. All right. Okay, so this was the mid-range device that he showed us. There was another device that he showed us, is that not only does it do what this one does, but it also measures the frequency spectrum of the power going into your gadget. So it's a spectrum analyzer combined with this. Uh, of course, that one's a bit more expensive, so we discounted using that altogether. Right, so what does this do, right? So we have an RF shield box here. Our device under test goes in here. The antenna of the uh, device under test is coupled to the antenna within here. And that one goes through this blue wire to the RF de event detector. So when there's a signal coming out from a gadget, it's received by this um, antenna. This event detector will detect it and um, display accordingly. Now this event detector is bi-directional. Yeah? For some gadgets, right, the, the devices don't only broadcast some need reception to to operate say a bluetooth connection so if it's an advertiser only it only puts out rf energy but some stay quiet until a connection is made maybe from your mobile phone android app or ios app right so this event detector has another input here which you connect with an antenna to your mobile phone so you can start off your Bluetooth connection or whatever transmission protocols here. The mobile phone will send through the antenna into here and the event detector will push it out. At the same time, the event detector will take the reading of what goes from your phone to your device under test. And then when your device under test responses with um, other RF energy, it will also measure that. So for this setup, it's only a one-way uh, detection. It's only from the device and the test. Now, why it's in a shield box is because we are fully radiated with a lot of uh, RF noise around us. So here we had a, a capture done earlier. I'm going to do another capture now. There's a button at the top there called Acquire. If I hit Acquire, we let it go through its steps. Four seconds, right? So what we're doing is we're capturing the current reading and the RF events based on the sample and duration setting there. So we're capturing 50,000 samples with an interval of 80 microseconds. So the resolution is very high enough. Now you can see that the green line here shows a lot of RF energy. So what Kang Ming has just done is that he has split up, split up the thing, um, the display, so that we have RF energy here and current reading here. Now you can see that there's a lot of um, RF noise here. Now that is not um, is not detrimental at this point, yeah, because we can notice that the spikes are here. However, the software will get confused. So we will do another measurement with the RF box closed. So it will stop all the extraneous noise coming in. I'm going to recapture the entire sequence. So this device under test currently we have inside there is not one of our designs. It's a reference from the Keysight provider also. So it's based on a um, Texas Instruments a Bluetooth advertiser. So here it has finished its um, acquisition. Now you can see that the RF events generated by the device are the only things displayed by the event detector. So it comes in nice little intervals of um, RF spikes. 
and here we can see the power consumption. Now I'm going to zoom in on one of these spikes and you will notice that Bluetooth does not just put out one burst. You'll notice that Bluetooth advertises in bursts of three at different frequencies. Yeah, so that is the resolution it can go down to when you're using 80 microsecond sampling rate. Yeah, you can go down even smaller, but your total captured length will be shortened. So if I zoom out again, now you can tell on power up sequence this bunch consumes a lot of current. So this was explained to us by Keysight in that this DUT, right, on power up, it blinks the LED four times. So it shows up here as this high amount of current. Yep. So for us, if you want to predict and estimate um, battery lifespan, we want to take after all this initialization um, routines have um, finished. So we are only interested in power consumption from here onwards. right? So what this um, device does, not only does it capture the information, it allows you to perform analysis on it. So the way to do analysis is to drag one of these um, cursors, any point, maybe just before this one, and we drag to another one down well, closer a bit. Uh. Which one? Oh, okay. All right. Wait, where did my cursor go? Oh, I got it. Just before one sensor reading. And again, just before the sensor reading. So you can see that the power consumption, the spikes occur at around the same time as the RF energy is sent. But you will see other spikes of energy uh, or current consumption that do not correspond to the RF burst. This, we think, we think we are not sure, comes from the CPU activating the sensor for a reading. Yeah? Some sensors consume a little more current during its measurement period. So these large spikes here that you see may come from, from sensor measurement, not from the RF advertising. So we include one of these large spikes here and exclude this one. So we take that interval and perform the analysis. And the anal analyze button. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> okay, so from that, all that analysis, it comes out with several charts like this, right? Um, before you do the analysis, of course, you fill in these um, tables and columns with um, with the information. The more important one is your battery capacity over here that tells you the how big your battery is yeah and from that it analyzes it it gives you some more readouts there and then um, finally at the bottom it gives an estimate of how many hours this battery will last provided it's performing this same set of operations again and again all right, so from there, we have useful information where the current is being spent from the battery. The, the most amount of time used up, oh, sorry, here it is. Occupied time is used up is in the standby mode. Yeah, when it wakes up to do, to do RF, to do RF transmission is only 3% of the time. The rest of the time is used up by some other um, CPU operations that's um, taking up 42.8% or 42.98%.
Yeah, so from that, we can tell that our software can further improve if we make all these changes to the software to reduce the amount of time and power used during those times. Yep, so I think this is a useful thing to have. Um, I haven't practiced with it yet. Um, K Ming has done some work. He has changed his code and observed changes in this uh, analysis. Any questions so far? I say it's a useful tool. Uh, uh, you say that that is a, a useful tool. I agree indeed. But how much? How much of one one such tool costs? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> this tool isn't cheap, huh? The main, the default um, configuration is this mainframe and these two modules. So the modules is the current uh, power supply module and the measurement, and the event detector. This set here costs thirty four thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> Wait, we haven't included the toaster box yet. <laughs> this is about 3K, eh? 3K. 3K, Sing dollars or you say Sing dollars, Sing dollars. So those makers won't have access to it, huh? I guess not, uh, yeah. I'm not sure we are going to get it too, yeah. De depends on how we evaluate this. So we have about two weeks to evaluate this um, before we apply for an extension. Maybe we can borrow it for, for up to a month. If we are lucky, we have more practice, we might show it off again at uh, the next hackware. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Satya? Uh, the battery DT applied to AH, did you enter manually or detected it? How does that work? Which, uh, which one is it? The battery DT. Uh, we entered it manually. Yeah, because we have foreknowledge of what battery we're going to use or we intend to use for the desired product, right? So, yeah, the, yeah it determines that. So, um, again, it, it calculates this by power, right? So, we also have an information somewhere for the battery voltage setting, which is here. So, here we have probably incorrectly set at just a 5 volts testing voltage, right? For actual lithium ions that are of your desired um, component, right? Maybe it's 4.2 volts, maybe it's 3.8 volts. You have to manually enter those information. So, um, this tool is also relatively new. Um, we've already discovered a few bugs. One of them is the user interface. We cannot enter this number manually. We have to type the number into Notepad. <laughs> we have to type the number in Notepad, cut <laughs> and paste it into the into the fields. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, we found a bug. <laughs> oh yeah. What was it? Um, was the acquire bug? So uh, again, the acquisition time and your sampling resolution determines how much um, information you can capture. If you captured it at a one second resolution, it can last a long time because you have a total of 262,000 samples. Yeah? But um, we've experimented with a long sample, um, long sample interval, one second. We lost a lot of information. We don't see the RF events and stuff like that. So that's not very useful. I think the, the narrower the sampling resolution, the interval, the higher the resolution, but you, your total length is shortened. Oh, sorry, where was the bug again? This one? Oh, yeah, Shift data, oh yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so, yeah. More bugs to feedback. Hopefully, we get a discount. <laughs> yeah. A any question? Yeah. Uh, measurement for the current. Okay. For the current, it probably has your standard circuitry for doing measurements. Um, the shunt resistance within it. Again, it's, um, it's built into the module. 
Yeah, but um, if you wanted to build DIY current measurement. So thanks for bringing it up because um, as of early this year, I, want, I was interested and intended to build a device called U Current. Yeah, so that's an open source DIY project. Yeah, it measures um, down to nano amps. So it's based on a couple of op amps and some high precision resistors. I got all the components, but I haven't had time to build it yet. So maybe next hardware. Yeah. And for the RF detection, um, I'm not familiar with RF detection techniques. It's probably a, a low noise amplifier. Our radio expert is behind us here. Well, radio conversant character is behind us. Um, a low noise amplifier coupled with a bandpass filter, maybe a decibel to linear converter, and then you get all those. So those spikes there that you see is actually measured RF energy. So it shows you, it, if we zoomed in on the legend, it will tell us, I think if we do this, it will tell us exactly how many dBMs that spike has and how much, um, this is 415 milliamps, I'm sorry, M, micro amps maybe. Oh, I'm sorry, here it is, Y, y axis for channel 1, 19, 195 micro amperes. So, yeah, so they are accurate measurements. Yeah, that's how I was trying to do that. RF, uh, you know, there are things like XRF uh, 1 or SDR, SDR yes. And this is just an antenna with an antenna. Yeah. It's like a wireless charging. Right, so that may provide a, an event detection, but I don't think it does measurement very accurately, which is traceable. I mean, um, an instrument maker would make their standards traceable, right? Yeah. yeah. Calibrated, yeah. <laughs> we can. Yeah. Is measured accurately by the device and so now the very high level of precision. That of course you need uh you need that uh, level of instrumentation. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> 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 <laughs>